Welcome, everybody. We're back again. The Four Musketeers, I think we'll, we should call ourselves. The Four Musketeers. Today we're talking about lockdown. The interesting thing is that next week, on the 17th of May, the UK will be out of lockdown, officially. All the restaurants and bars and clubs and pubs and everywhere will be open. And I'm sure the whole of the country is going to go mad. You know, because we've been locked down for over a year, on and off. And uh, who knows if it's the last one. Because uh, we've uh, gone through this vaccine process. We've gone through this uh, situation where we have to keep our distance from each other. No hugging, no kissing, no large events. And even funerals had to have a limit as to how many people could attend. It's, uh, it's been a, a sad year for many. You know, that quite a few people have lost relatives and some who have had COVID now have long COVID because there are symptoms that are lasting beyond the original illness. And we have to be thankful that, you know, we are still here, we, we are well, and, um, you know, we have to be grateful to God for that. So we're going to talk about lockdown and I'm going to go around the table, so to speak, find out how people felt before lockdown, when we knew it was coming. This was before March last year, when we heard it was in China and we heard that it might be reaching around the world. And I think initially we probably didn't believe it. But once we heard that lockdown was coming, how did we feel? And then how did we feel during lockdown? Let's start with Eve Anderson. How did I feel when lockdown was coming? To be quite honest, I didn't know what I felt because I didn't know what lockdown was going to be about. None of us did until we really went into it. And I don't even think that government was sure about what it was all about. Um, Work-wise, it hasn't changed greatly apart from increased the workload because I work in human resources and I worked on an operational basis until recently. Um, it just felt like business as usual from home. Um, and But also there was a bit of trepidation about what was going to happen with the virus, how widely it was going to spread, whether this government was going to be able to manage the situation because I had no confidence in Boris about anything. So basically I just thought, how are they going to manage such a serious situation? Those are the main things I, I thought about. As it happened, my oldest daughter, her where she was actually renting for a few years, um, had um, at least came to an end in February. And she said, Mum, can I come home? She's getting married later in the year. And I said, yeah. So we both went into lockdown together. And I, I looked back and I thought that was a blessing because I had company, we could just like, you know, comfort each other for what was going on and talk about it and, you know, um, I had that company there, I wasn't on my own anymore. So that was, um, you know, that was my thinking early on into lockdown. Going through it, I think my emotions really just took, you know, um, different twists and turns really. And um, I thought what was good is like, you know, on Facebook or other all the things these new groups just emerged you know people quite resourceful they're like oh there's one that i joined which is called um lockdown cuisine uh, lockdown cuisine <laughs> where people <laughs> people of our hue mainly um were just you know talking about you know what we used to do and when we were you know poor and you know sort of foods we used to cook and how we could like to do dumpling and rub up this and all fix the other and you know, stretch a penny and all those kinds of things. And, you know, so on the on this particular group, you could showcase your meals that you'd made. So I started doing that. But also I started to look at things like I hadn't done in a while. And I thought, you know, I'm going to make something I haven't made in a while and I'm going to do some baking. So really I've started to do things that I hadn't done for years and years and years in, 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 this, in this time. So I'm on my own now since, since August, my own little place here. But I've been doing things like, you know, baking, you know, um, American biscuits and bread stuff and pizza bases and all kinds of things that I hadn't touched for ages. But I just felt that, why not? Why not do it now? I mean, I've been working very hard during the day to the evening, but I, I rediscovered some of the skills that I used to use 
quite a bit and it's been it's been also a voyage of discovery that's what i call it yeah mm. okay victoria yeah hi <clears throat> i was just writing some notes down so um i i traveled and i will continue to travel now um from i think my next travel will be in august i'll go somewhere but i used to travel and I, like I said, I will continue to travel. Um, what, about once a month, I was out the house, out the country, wow. with, my, with my work. So um, I'd be in either Brazil, Pakistan, Germany, the US, um, Ireland, etc. So I travelled a lot. And um, so for me, it I'd just come back from Germany. I think I'd just come back from Germany. I had on the thirty first, coming up to about the thirty first of month, of January. And I've got a really close friend of mine who's in China and she'd come back in the December for Christmas, but she was very ill at Christmas. And um, so we talked quite a lot, but I, I wasn't well neither in the January. So I, I mentioned that because um, it was, I was ill for about eight weeks until about beginning of April, something like that. And, and the doctors couldn't kind of get it under control to see what it was. But um, it was, it, it was, I've had pneumonia a couple of times, so we knew it was pneumonia anyway. Um, so yeah, so that was, I suppose that was my first start of not feeling too well, but I, I'm the type of person who pushes through as much as possible. So I don't stay in bed at all, um, except for my daughter's always complaining that I'm coughing all night long. So, um, so that was my first kind of understanding that um, something was happening. Um, I think my first aspect was that I, I read a lot um, I got involved with a lot of reading. Um, there was so much information coming out in March and April and all of this type of stuff. And I and um, I decided to, whether that was consciously or unconsciously, approach this whole situation like a project. And um, a project which I needed to identify what the challenges were um, in relation for in relation to my um, family and my students and friends. Um, family is really important because I have three I've got three daughters and, and I'm a double parent, meaning I, I'm the, the mother, the father, the auntie, uncle, everybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, one of my daughters suffers quite badly, even though it's under control. She doesn't take medication or anything like that, but she's under control with anxiety. Um, she's quite good with her triggers now, but I just thought this was going to trigger it completely over the top. And um, I had to kind of work, look at the challenges, what was on our plate and kind of able to work through those. So when she came home or where any of them came home and said about COVID and, you know, this person's got it and everything else. And I had to really kind of be very pragmatic about it, that everybody will know somebody who's got it and you'd need to just manage it. That really helped because once I said that, you know, this, this is going to be the way it's going to be, you just need to kind of just work through it, not get stressed out about it. The house became a very, very um, easygoing house. And that was one of my most important things. And the other aspect is around students. Uh, my students, I've got a lot of international students. I'm at UCL, so it's an elite establishment. And um, I had prepared all my session to be on, to be face to face in April. And we had two, ne two weeks notice um, as we shut down in March. My lesson was going to start, my two modules were going to start um, in April. So it's about three weeks notice. So I had to turn them around and including the Easter holidays. So I was very, very concerned about how I was going to present my work, which was one of them was sociology of race. And it was the first time I'd taken on that module. And it was the first time that they had a black person, an academic, taking it on. It had always been white. So um, there was double kind of, issues for me to think about um, and then the other one and um, so I, I think I, f I felt that I became a resource I went I started up jogging because of course my gym wasn't open so I started jogging and I still do it and I did it um, every other day um, and I still do it and I do 5k once a week but I do two and a half k every other day um, snow ice and everything and I've and um, the unfortunate part for us for all of us in, in where I live is that we live by the forest. And so really, it, it didn't really make much um, impact for us. I mean, I'm not somebody who goes out all the time, but I do go to the forest with my dogs. And it was good for the girls to be there as well. My youngest daughter, who's just turned 16, 
there was a there's a place in the forest where she can run so she was able to run her, si her sisters took her out quite a lot because she's also very competitive in sport so i did concern myself about that as well thinking she normally does five days of competitive sport what's she going to be like is she going to go in a downer she didn't see friends she didn't see any friends from between the time the schools locked down in the end of march until late September not one single friend and it wasn't that because the friends weren't around but that's a different discussion they just they just kind of forgotten about her she, and you know she goes to a private school I think I told you that it's kind of a top private school so I, hopefully that gives you a little taster so really I approached it like a project which I think was good for me um, I also was very much involved with the political aspect of what was going on I was very we live in a very very affluent kind of area which is um you don't get many police wandering around here telling you to put your mask on. Or we don't do it outside anyway. Put your mask. You know, people aren't chasing you out out of the green spaces or anything like that. It's not that kind of place. So, um, and I and I was very conscious of that as well. Um, that uh, certain you know, go to other parts of London, it's very difficult. So yeah. So I suppose the other thing I would say, Dawn, is that I was very I was acutely politically aware of what was happening also across the world in places like African countries, the Caribbean, and, and why is it? And, and the question that I have in my head, which I'll just end on, is I, I still have not been convinced the reason why there was a need to go to one, South Africa, and two, Brazil, to test out the vaccine. Only that South Africa was the Afrikaans who wanted it to be tested in the townships. And it was that um, awful, um, unfortunate president in Brazil who, want, who was able to, because one of his things on his mandate was that he wanted to get rid of as many black people in Brazil as possible. So I do worry about that. And yes, they used to, they did have um, COVID, but they didn't have, all of a sudden they had this variant, which I, I don't understand how all of a sudden the vaccine was meant to do X, Y, and Z, and it just cre created a problem which they didn't have so badly. Now comes India hasn't got such you know people aren't saying that about Indian variant but they did with Brazil and um, uh, South Africa so I'm, I'm, I'm consciously and very consciously politically aware of what's going on with our own people especially with the vaccine as well is that enough for you Dawn? Yeah that's great thank you that's well. yeah um, Dawn so thank you um, once again for the opportunity to have this discussion because um, unlike um, the rest of my um, panelists, I actually started my um, COVID journey in Ghana. And um, the good thing was that our president at the time, of, well, the president in Ghana, Nana Kufwadu, did a fantastic job of communicating with his population. I think I've mentioned it before in one of my um, other comments. Um, but, you know, he basically quickly put in place a regular communicate with the population. Uh, we were regularly informed and updated as to what was going on um, in, you know, as far as COVID was concerned. And we had um, a two week um, lockdown period, if I remember correctly. So that's when we had to stay at home, or was it a month? Well, let's just say a month, okay? Around that time, it was about a month, the whole of March um, or April, it was April, yeah, we were on, on lockdown. Um, you know, and it really was a case of Ghana's numbers were very, very low for a long, long time. Um, and um, in the meantime, I had actually booked to come to London for the summer because my son was due to start school here. Um, and, you know, he, he was actually coming to, to the UK to boarding school. Um, so we were preparing for that anyway. Um, but what then happened is that um, obviously the flights were all cancelled, so we couldn't leave. Um, and so after several cancellations by August, um, I decided that we were going to use the evacuation flight to leave Ghana. So we did um, and came as British citizens on this flight with other people, nationals that had you know, been stranded in Ghana um, to the UK. Um, and when, when I got here, I realised that um, he, my son wouldn't be going to boarding school because, again, 
things just you know obviously by this stage the things were really being um london was seeing a lot of um well a massive increase in the numbers of people contracting covid and the advice from the boarding school was that you know we could work from home or we had options but i didn't see the point of paying uh, they weren't reducing the, the fees by the way i didn't see the point of paying boarding school fees to, <laughs> to go and come and sit in the house and not benefit so i just cancelled i just pulled the plug on the whole boarding school thing and had him at home and found a local school and you know it was probably one of the best decisions i made because things didn't get any better mm. so um the the thing about moving from ghana to the uk i had these grand plans when i got um, you know when i was coming initially before the lockdown that you know when i get here i'll be networking i'll be out and about and touching base with all my peeps and you know it all work smoothly but obviously when i got here it was a very different kettle of fish um the fortunate thing for me was that um i was actually able to continue working with a client in ghana using zoom and the whole thing around working from home started working in my benefit you know so zoom um you know all all of the team in that in that particular company came online we were running our training sessions online you know i suddenly realized that the world actually opened up for me mm. um as a consultant so you know i didn't lose any work basically um, which was a really um great thing mm. because um obviously i didn't have i didn't have the ability to really connect um, or look for work um, here in the UK as things were shutting down um, between August and December. So anyway, I continued that contract. Um, the good thing was also um, I managed to get online with a lot of, um, you know, lots of forums were coming up. Um, you know, the World Economic Forum were doing lots of presentations, lots of other things that you would normally have to pay quite a bit of money to attend mm -hmm. were now driven online, which was actually really beneficial. And um, you know, making some contacts online um, just became a lot easier, actually. Um, so, yeah, I thought yeah, even though it was challenging because I was shifting from one country to the other, I had to pivot, you know. And one thing I must say is that I can't say I'm one of the best people with technology up until this point, even though I've worked in international companies and we did use all of these technologies. I wasn't really au fait with um you know, or trying to understand how it worked. I was just a user, you know, um, and what um, lockdown I think has done for me is given me an opportunity to really get to understand and not just be a user, but practice getting um, actively using the technology in a different way mm. um, and learning new skills. So I've had to pivot. And I think a lot of people in my generation, a lot of my friends certainly have had to or have, have, have ignored or haven't bothered to try and pivot their skills and learn new skills in order to try and, um, you know, keep up with the technology. Mm. Um, but in pivoting, I've been able to maintain contact. So it's, it's been, you know, from the technological aspect, I think I've been able to keep up with things, fortunately. Mm. Mm. Um, from the relationship building side of things it's taken me a while you know to build relationships I, I find it difficult actually connecting online I, I really do but I'm learning how to use or become more comfortable with you know um, speaking on a one-to-one -one even online and connecting better online um, so all of that you know I think Maybe I'm talking about it from a skills point of view because I'm a HR focused person. But from a, um, the other, the beneficial side, from a family um, standpoint, what happened was coming back to the UK, my two oldest children were here, in fact. And um, I hadn't really been around them for probably about my son for about six years and my daughter about four. Um, I hadn't been in the same space of, um, with them for a very long time. So what lockdown did was give us an opportunity to reconnect as a family, oh, which great. was the best thing that could oh. have ever happened. I mean, honestly, I've walked in um, to a new kind of lease of life because oh. they're young adults now and they come with a completely different set of energy. <laughs> and the moments where I had my little breakdowns, 
I had these young adults surround me and give me so much love and support. Oh. It's just been absolutely um, amazing, I have to say. You know, and my daughter and I would go for walks together. Um, you know, again, exercise wasn't really a priority for me. I'm a bit of a workaholic, so it's work, work, work. But my daughter insisted that we go for walks, we exercise. And so I started to build a regime around, you know, exercising regularly or walking regularly. And, um, you know, again, I'm now doing online exercising. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Things that you just don't think of. A my whole trainer, new world. My trainer is online and I'm there with them on, you know, doing my exercise. It's just absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, things that ordinarily I wouldn't have thought about doing, you can now, I think it's become a bit more accessible, you know, because all the time that you used to travel to get somewhere to do something is out of the way. And you can actually allocate time to do things that give you a bit more of your life back. Hmm. So I now see that I've got a bit more of a work-life balance in my life and I want to maintain that. I've actually committed to myself to try and maintain that. So if I'm looking for work opportunities, I'm looking more for a, a relationship where I can do the online bit as well as, you know, if you have to see me face to face, it's managed um, better. Yeah. So hmm. it's been, I think, um, an interesting experience. Um, yeah, we've had our moments, but Overall, it's been, I would say, um, transformational. Mm. You know, I've had to rethink my lifestyle, yeah. which has been good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's been an amazing 18 months, to be honest. Um, we heard the, about this pandemic over in China. I think from about December, January, we heard that things were brewing over there. And uh, most of us thought it was going to stay over that kind, that side of the world, didn't we? We didn't imagine that we'd end up traveling everywhere. And when it started to hit Britain, then we realized, oh, it's a bit close to home now. We really have to do something about it. I was doing some tempi work outside the home at that time, um, kind of running my business in the evening and working during the day and then when lockdown came it meant that I too had to stay at home and continue that work in addition to my business um, from home and that was very different it kind of felt so much easier because not having to travel an hour and a half each way every day you know it's like it gave you a longer day it's like you had an extra three hours in your day and I would imagine that's how most people felt who were working from home, especially those who are commuting in from, from the shires, from the, from the villages and the towns outside London. You know, all that travel time is now yours. You can practically wake up later, you know, you're at home with the family or the dogs or the cats, and you can also finish late or finish on time and you have extra time for your leisure. And that was, that was really, um, life-changing i would imagine for many people especially if you've spent 20 years commuting all of a sudden you can actually do your work from home uh, and that was a privilege you've got to say because we know that there are many jobs that didn't have that privilege i mean for instance the, the national health service the nurses and doctors who were almost being forced to work in very dangerous conditions and forced to work overtime as well because when your colleague is ill or they have to isolate, then you have to cover their shift. So, you know, I felt it for the National Health Service. I felt it for those people who are going through, you know, the nightmare every day when they're having to deal with uh, with uh, patients and having to deal with extra deaths that they're not used to. And, you know, thankfully, thankfully we're coming out of it. I heard that today is zero deaths from COVID in England. You know, and we had times when there were a thousand, over a thousand deaths in a day. And we've also got a spare thought for those people lost, you know, family and friends. And I lost my stepdad, you know, he, he died a month after lockdown last year, April. And it wasn't specifically because of COVID, but let's put it this way. He delayed going to the hospital. He delayed calling help because he was, he was worried about calling COVID, catching COVID in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if 
the ambulance had been called earlier, he might still be with us. But, you know, so in a way, it's a kind of a, a side, indirect death to COVID. And, you know, we're coming out of it now, but many of us will remember friends or family who are no longer with us. With regards to my business, um, I went back to doing that full time, I think around June. And because with my business, I normally work from home anyway, it wasn't really an issue. So for me, it was as if nothing had changed. I've been working from home since 2001 for most of the time, apart from when I do odd work outside on a temporary basis. So I continue to push uh, black economics, my business and my tech business as well, while I do web design and marketing for businesses. But that's the kind of thing you can do from home. I had a major project to do the uh, department store uh, around September, which made us mega busy, as in, you know, 300 phone calls coming in on your phone a day. That's mega busy. And having to deal with a uh, thousand emails in a week. So that was interesting. And it made me realize that business doesn't actually stop because there's a lockdown, because people do business by phone, they do business via Zoom. And apparently we've gone forward five years in terms of technology because of this pandemic. You know, the kind of things that we're doing now via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Skype even, um, we're talking about everybody doing this now, not just, you know, 10% of people. We're talking about everybody getting used to the fact that there are events online. And a lot of these events were free. So I took the opportunity to learn as much as I could from all these um, events that were going on. Uh, took the opportunity to read, took the opportunity to interview various people and uh, picked up on video editing, which uh, proves very handy when you've got a YouTube channel, I'll tell you. And uh, really, I just felt there's got to be a time that it's got to be more productive because let's face it, we don't think we'll get another time like this. Okay, once things open up in a week's time, and we're hoping that we're never going to have lockdown again ever, we're going to look back at this time and we're probably going to look back wistfully and think, oh, wish we were at home doing what we needed to do. <laughs> wish, wish the roads were empty. Oh, the roads were so beautiful to drive on you went outside the air was clean you could you could breathe in you know deep breaths because it, the pollution had disappeared it was quite amazing and um it's funny how so many uh british families wanted to get pets or extra pets the dog the the pet dog market apparently is booming so is the cat market to the point where before the pandemic, we had two cats. Uh, now that lockdown is ending, we don't have two cats. They were stolen. <gasps> yeah, they stole our cats. You know, we like to let our cats outside so they can run about in the garden. Well, that uh, worked well for a few months. And then uh, after a while, the cats weren't coming for dinner anymore. You know, you're putting out dinner and just, for a week, no cats. And basically they've been gone for about two months now. So uh, it looks like cats are big business. And I hear in one area that cats are just disappearing like mad. So people don't want to, uh, don't seem to want to go the legal route of buying cats now. They're just nicking one if they find one uh, in the garden. So, um, what I found interesting also was Liverpool Street and Canary Wharf were virtually empty. You know how the city is so busy, usually during, during the week time? Yeah, so I felt it for those business owners, those sandwich shops and burger bars and cafes that would normally depend on the city, city workers to come and spend their money and spend seven pounds a day on lunch. Yeah. No more, because everybody's having their own lunch at home. So I felt it for them, but no doubt they'll be back soon. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how many firms actually open up the doors and say, well, everybody comes back. I think there's more gonna be a hybrid system where some people come to work, some people stay home for part of the, part of the week. Now that companies have worked out that yes, we can 
we can actually run our business without having these expensive spaces in central London or Canary Wharf. I wonder how many of them are going to go back. That should be interesting to see. Or maybe it might be that in about six months, a year's time, it will be as if there was no pandemic. Everything will be back to normal. Everybody will be out every day and tearing their hair out. And Oh, dear. And the pollution is going to go sky high. Oh, well, that's life. But things have changed. I had to go on a very long drive in the middle of the pandemic, and I was worried the computer was, I was worried that the police was going to stop me because uh, my youngest daughter was finishing university. Well, she kind of finished it a term early because of the pandemic, so I had to go and get her during the Easter holidays. So I was quite worried that I was going to get stopped because you know that they were saying you're not allowed to leave your local area. So I was looking out for the police all the way up the M1 and all the way back down. Well, I didn't get stopped, not once. So that was good. <laughs> that was good. But um, yeah, it's been an eventful year, Sorry. you know, and uh, thank God we've uh, come through it. But even so, even as things open, we still have to be careful. So I want us to think now about as things open, are there things that we feel that we're going to change over the next months or so? Things that we used to do that we're not going to do anymore? Are there things that you feel that have changed in life that are never going to be the same again? What are your thoughts there? Let's start with you, Victoria. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. I knew you was going to say me. <laughs> um, what has changed? It's an interesting one. Uh, my daughter's up until whenever it was, um, whenever the, the school ones came back to school, I think it was, when was it? I can't remember when it was now, but anyway, my youngest one went back to school, but the rest, the other two stayed at home, working from home. Um, What's changed? I, I've, I'm an academic, so I've always had the luxury of working from home anyway. So, um, and I will continue, And but I always used to do like a, a few days in the office and a few days at home. And I will continue to do a few days in the office and a few days at home because uh, it's about, to me, it's all about people. I'm not somebody who thinks it's about machinery. Um, and um, And I think, that for me is crystal clear. And I think that's, that's definitely what I see with, with what I do in my work, that it's not about, oh, I, I'm gonna work from home and, and see less of who I want to see. It's not the same. I mean, I work with uh, students. If without students, we wouldn't be paid. And that's the way I look at it. I'm very, I'm very conscious about that. And my, the students I deal with are paying a lot of money. Um, they do not want to be on Zoom at all and um even though i've got they're, they're all on zoom at the moment and there's options of live like it is now with us now talking there's also the option if somebody's not able to do the live session they can do a recorded session and have a seminar the next day at the moment i think only about four or five people out of 40 will just listen to the recorded session and then just do the seminar interaction with anything they picked up the next day which I think is quite interesting so um, I think we one for me it, I think we we have to be very mindful that um, of mental health and it's real with young people it's real with I've got a student with me at the moment who's come from um, uh, one of the top universities I won't name it and um, they signed up to do a PhD which is fine from another country and um, came in in October or September and has struggled. Um, she's a young Christian, has struggled and uh, went back home to where she came from and come back out again. But she was blessed, she's come to my house and um, has opened up a lot, i.e. that she's near, the, she's near the forest, she can wander around. She's feeling that her mental health is, is back on track. So coming back to your question, which I kind of gone around, around in a corner, what's, what's, what's happened, what's changed? I think one of the things which I've noted more is um, how, 
how some members of the community have used the notion of COVID as a mask, as a way of masking their, their, their racism. And I'm not saying that to be, to be flippant, but um, it is noticeable where I live that um, ra racist activities, even walking past you on the street because they feel the pavement isn't big enough for both of you. And I have found myself saying, if you're finding it that difficult to walk outside, stay in your house as against stay, you know, trying not to walk, walk near me when the, when the pavement is a very large pavement. So those types of things I find uh, are rather difficult to deal with. Um, but it's, it, to me, it's just showing what people are really like. There's more showing what people are really like. Even when people, some people hand you their money in your hand and some people just throw it on the counter. And with that in mind, you think, well, I don't really want your item anyway. So, you know, there's all those types of things which, so I suppose in the nutshell, and then I'll shut up, it's, um, I think more things have been more, uh, show more crystal clear, even the clapping on the doorstep and what that actually meant and how that was, how Boris Johnson, I, I mean, yeah, one last thing. I think the way Boris Johnson has utilized this pandemic as an opportunity to, not engage with well to pull people away from brexit and the fallout of that i think is a disgrace absolute disgrace especially when you think about how many businesses which have come out of their um out of the um out of the government for millions and there's no scrutiny and there's no criteria of how that happens so i think that's something i'll always remember that they've used this i like, use this the the actual disaster for their benefit and I think that's really sad oh. okay Eve I agree on that last point uh, Victoria I do think that Boris Johnson has been very much a opportunist in um, this pandemic in terms of his failings around negotiating deals for Brexit Brexit was the hot 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 potato of the previous couple of years and very, very key in terms of the, the year that um, we went through before we actually did leave the EU. And um, it's all gone quiet. Mm. <laughs> What's mm. going on? Mm. Not hearing anything at all. And I can't really say that he's really talking about the pandemic because he's not even really talking about that. You know, he has his advisors talking about it, but he's not really talking about it. So I think to myself, what, it, what exactly are you doing? <laughs> what are you engaging in? What are you? What are you doing? If you did the time and motion, what are you doing? So uh, I don't know. I don't know on that one. So um, I'll just leave that there. But I concur with what you're saying about that. So what's changed for me, and will not go back to what it was before. Do you know what's changed? I'm always very smartly turned out, apart from when I'm on my own and chilling in my house, and you know, not on Zoom or anything else like that. But um, Appearances are important, but also they're, they're not so important anymore. You know, you can sit in your office with your leggings on and nobody knows as long as you've got a smart top. Mm -hmm. You look great and you look the part. And in the beginning, I used to wear pajama buttons <laughs> and then the top. Secret Santa. One of my, yeah, one of my smart tops I'd have like this. And pajama buttons, and I thought, I used to think, well, why not? And um, you know, I'm not being vain. I'm not a vain person at all. I'm not. But, you know, I, I, the previous day I was thinking, oh, I've got nice smart outfits. I'm going to be going out and, you know, sort of like beautiful sequined dresses and all kinds of stuff. And it's just sitting in my wardrobe gathering dust and, you know, being nibbled by moths or something or whatever it perhaps happens to it now. And I just think, will I ever go back to that? And I'm, I'm not you know, like a fashion door or something like that. But, you know, really going out and about because my big thing is, and uh, is, is going amongst strangers at close proximity to enjoy an event. And that for me just fills me with terror, really. I'm just thinking, I just don't want to do it. Um, so that thing, and you do that if you go to a special event, it doesn't matter if it's a charitable event or 
party or part on a boat or in a, in a in a in a um, you know a nice venue or something. It used to be just a great feeling of great, I'm going to go, but now it's kind of about who's going to be there. Um, you know, they're going to social distance or you know, just the normal etiquettes that people do or do not you know stick to. Um, in a, in a situation like that, now becomes a whole different thing. It wouldn't mean anything much before. Mm. If somebody brushed by you in a crowded, you know, room, it wouldn't mean very much if it's a you know event. But now it does. So things that were normal um, have become a certain extent um, abnormal in how you view them. So for me, that's for me definitely um, in terms of looking after my own health and well-being. Um, is something that I don't know if I'll go back to. Not that I was going out and about all the time, but I just like to go out, dress up, look fantastic, and then go out and have a nice time. But now I'm just thinking, is it worth it? Just in case of something that might happen to me, um, it could potentially, um, because you still can get COVID uh, any time. That can still happen. So I really have to still be wary. Yeah. So I guess that's changed in how I view that. Um, but also, um, I had to go back to Birmingham at the end of last week to, you know, my aunt, my aunt's burial, and she was very close to us. We were all, she was like another mother, so was a distant aunt, lots of close aunts, relatives like that. And um, I, I, it was so great just to be there with my grandparents, you know, I'm in my mid fifties, but you know, when you're only grandparents, you just become, you know, like almost like a child again, you know, <laughs> because of the love that they show you, and you know, then they feed you and they check you all right. And they, oh, I just was lapping it up. I was lapping it up, and so um, I don't think I take that for granted, but I, I'm going to appreciate that so much more because I hadn't seen them for just over a year, and that's the last time I saw my aunt was the day before they locked down on the 15th of March. That's when I saw her. So if I hadn't gone there, oh. I've disappeared. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. yeah, that was weird. Um, gremlins or something. Or oh, maybe it's my auntie. Auntie. <laughs> Just saying hi. Um, but if I hadn't been there on that day, um, I wouldn't have seen her until, you know, I wouldn't have seen her. So I, I, I cherish the fact of seeing your loved ones more than anything. I would never, ever, ever take that for granted because if anyone ever took that for granted, lockdown taught you something else. But in an instant, that can be removed from you and you don't have the power to change it because none of us could change it because legally... We're in a position where someone, some stranger can say to you, you can't see your loved ones. So I don't take that for granted at all. So um, if that's a lesson to learn, that's definitely one that I'll take forward and appreciate those who are close to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. More. Victoria. Sorry, Aswa. <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah, what's changed? I think... Um, Really, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk about um, travel because I think it was so easy just to think about your next trip somewhere, um, mm. hopping over to the state. You could just hop. Now it's a bit more of a, a challenge or, 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 or in fact, it's kind of, now we've got red spots and green spots. I don't think people are going to really take to traveling anytime too soon in the same way that we used to. Mm. Um, sitting on a plane doesn't feel as comfortable as it used to, let alone doing all the tests that you need to, which come with a, a significant bill. <laughs> Let's not forget that part, mm. you know, before you even get on the plane. Um, so, yeah, that for me feels um, quite strange. Um, and I'm just getting my mindset different around what travel now means to me. Mm. Um, you know, that it's, it, it's going to have a significant, a different meaning in my life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that's changed is the high street, right? All these mm. shops that have disappeared. 
Yes. Um, and, and, you know, the, the small shops in particular, you know, when I walk along my high street now, I see so many shops that are closed. I'm just hoping that they open up or they get some support to open up because it, it just feels so hollow and hmm. uh, weird. You know, I, I, every time I walk, I just feel a bit sad. Let's put it that way. You know, not seeing some of the, seeing some of the smaller shops still closed hmm. um, and not knowing what they're going to do or what they, what's been done to help them yeah. to, to open up, you know. I don't want to have to travel into town. Or I, I really don't actually like online shopping. I find it quite annoying because every time the goods comes, it doesn't. Ne it never looks like it did in the, <laughs> in the magazine or on, online for some strange reason. It never fits me for a yeah. start. I'm always going backwards and forwards to the post office, sending things back. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, we all hear that one. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, that that does disturb me and. Um, I think that um, it just means that our shopping lifestyle is going to change, I think, which will be, I don't know what direction it's going to go in, but the young people seem to feel okay with the changing their shopping lifestyle. They, I mean, my daughter literally shops online and feels no way about it, and she seems to always get it right. I'm the one that's still struggling with it, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, those are the two main things that comes to mind around change. I don't really have, I mean, there's so much more that's going to change. I know that much, but you know, that that's what came to mind as you asked the question. Can, can I say something? I, I know you're going to speak next um, Dawn, but I just wanted to say something about online shopping, which I think as a coming from a parent, can I just say a couple of sentences if I may? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, online shopping. I mean, my daughter's 16 and she, and, and the other two are young, are adults as well. Well, she's not yet adult, 16. But um, online shopping, it, it's quite interesting. The youngest one, who's six foot one plus, has, has got to the stage now that online shopping is very difficult for her mm. because she's forever sending stuff back. And she's got a prom being made, a prom dress being made just very quickly. And um, she knows what she wanted. Now, if it wasn't for the fact that my oldest daughter knows a vintage shop stroke designer who would make a dress, she would be finding it so difficult to mm. buy something online to fit 38 inch leg and to, and a tall person who's tiny physique to buy something. So for her, she was able to try on about eight different dresses in the shop mm. and also get it made for the length she wants. So I, I, I'm an optimist that, you know, that people, that the notion of online shopping, it's not going to be it's not going to be for everybody and it's okay for us to have some shops to be able to go around and also for people just as a people aspect because we're not robots and, I, and I'll always keep saying that we are not robots we're made to be made to be near each other and I'll shut up now well the interesting thing is I went to a shopping center on Saturday and most of the shops were open um, it was Westfield in West London. But the interesting thing is that it was quite crowded, considering that the restaurants weren't open as normal. They, they would, you know, even the food court, they said, oh, you have to take the food out of the premises. But people just sat on the floor around the shopping centre and ate, you know, no one's taking food outside. It's not exactly warm now, is it, really? But people were happy to be out because they could see other human beings, you know, and that's one of the reasons I went up there. I, I need to see people again. I need to make sure I'm not the only one still here. And, uh, <laughs> and it, it was good. It was really good. And it wasn't too crowded. It wasn't like Christmas crowded, but it was like midweek crowded, you know, where people were out, a lot of young people out and uh, people of all age ranges really uh i'm happy to see that everything's going to be opening up again but i'm sort of thinking well where do i want to go that i wasn't able to go in the last in the last year you know well you know it'd be nice to actually be able to go into restaurants and eat rather than sit outside in the cold i've tried that once or twice it's not fun and it'd be nice to actually you know go to cinema when that's open I mean, for goodness sake, you know. <laughs> and then theatre, 
or maybe go to an art gallery, a museum, even places that you didn't used to go to that much. Now you kind of feel, oh, I need, to, I need to, I need to get there. Yeah. You know, gym, spa, check out a hotel. You know, do do the kind of things that you wouldn't normally be doing, and even seeing family and friends when people have been scared to leave the house and scared to have a hug and. You know, it really does feel like a release. And I think that England is going to go mad over the next few weeks. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be crazy. The oh, that are... was another thing, Dawn, I wanted to mention. Crime rate. Didn't the crime rate go right down? Yeah. During this whole period? It did. It did in some I mean, sectors. We saw an increase in the number of women being abused, abused. in the home, yeah. domestic yeah. violence. But it must, it gun must violence be... went down. It must be your worst nightmare as a woman to be stuck in a house with a man who's abusing you. Oh gosh! It yeah. must be your worst nightmare. I mean, you know, that's a, time that you, that's a time that you really want to be single. You know? What about children that were being uh, that are being abused? Yeah. I saw a, a young man on the bus crying his eyes out because he had left home and his because his father was hitting him and he just walked out and he was on the bus crying. Oh, poor thing. I was so, I just, I was beside myself. Oh, wow. And, and there must have been, that was an isolated instance, but there must have been so many of those situations. That's where right. People being physically abused. And there was a lot, of, a lot of extra sexual abuse as well. Sexual abuse. Both yeah. in terms of uh, against women and also young people as well, children. So for some, it's not been a, it's been a horrendous time for some, you know. But could I just say one thing, Dawn? And I, yeah. I, I just want to say, just take it in the context that I'm saying it. I'm not trying to preface it to make, for people to feel in a certain way, but there were points in time during lockdown where I thought to myself, are we part of some huge social experiment? <laughs> with the different rules that were being made and, and all kinds of things that were brought in. And I'm I'm not a conspiracy person in terms of saying COVID is real. I know it's real, definitely. I've lost people I knew very well to, to COVID and not people who were hugely ill or anything like that. But there were times when I just thought, you know, are they gathering data? Are they observing us as social, you know, uh, professionals, social, sociological professionals and so forth? And are they writing papers are they pulling together some huge database on our reactions because you know in terms of human beings being um controlled in terms of human beings um obeying orders in terms of human beings how we you know come together in times of crisis how we deal with fear how we do with a whole plethora of things. I wondered at times to myself, are we part of a some sort of an experiment too? Because some of the rules made sense and some of them didn't. Mm. But mm. I thought, is there a bigger picture that we'll find out in the future? And let's watch that space and see in a couple of years what comes out of it. I don't mean. I think there there will be some a lot of documentation that will no, be done. I don't mean. I was about to say afterwards. I don't mean the normal research that you're right. doing. I mean person. the wider picture in terms yes. of the government seeing yeah. what we will obey, not obey, all those kinds of things, coming out with something else. So we had some very confusing things coming out for Boris and his people. And he was like, well, what was all that about? That doesn't even make any sense. But we complied, you know, and then something else would come out. And people, people were talking about it. And that was what I couldn't understand. People were talking about it and saying, what was he talking about? The next day, be like, did you understand that? No, it's going to be X, it's going to be Y, and we're just going to do it. So I mean, I mean the government, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the government. And I don't mean just general government control, but I just thought... Yeah, I think I'd be inclined to agree with you. I'm sure there was a lot of... I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And I think there's more behind it, but let's see. What do you think, Victoria? Tough one. Um, I'm... There's things I'd like to say, but this is recorded, so yeah, I, think, okay. I, think, I think I'll keep my mouth quiet, really. Okay. Um, I just think that, I'll just say what I've said before, is what concerns me is the, um, 
the positioning of people which are not white in this country. Mm. And I think that's what concerns me. Yeah. And that's one area that we didn't bring forward, the Black Lives Matter, George Floyd's incident, murder happened 24th of May last year, right in the middle of a lockdown, bit of a shock for the whole world. And there were marches everywhere. Yes, even in the middle of a pandemic. And that was amazing to see. The fact that there were so many people who came out and not just black people either, but white people, Asians, everyone came out. And even in countries that we didn't even think that they knew what black people were, they were out there marching and saying Black Lives Matter. And mm -hmm. that was encouraging to see. And some corporates began to take notice and said, okay, we need to change our policies. We need to either hire more blacks or we need to have more blacks in senior positions. And stores were beginning to say we need to, you know, give space to black owned businesses. I mean, these are the kind of things that people have been asking for for years. And a black man dies on camera and all of a sudden it's all happening. And then we, and then we have three, three black people die in custody here, in, uh, two of them in Wales and one in London, I think it is. Was it London? Uh, three black men die in custody of the police and, and it's as though nothing happened. Yeah. So, somehow. And, that only, and that's recently. One yeah. Was in, I think, yeah. Somehow nothing. that's not making the news for whatever reason. Yeah. They're covering it up. Yeah. And uh, yeah. they certainly don't want to see another set of uh, protests going on out in the street. Uh, it's a sad situation, really. Um, some things have changed for the better. But other things I think have got worse. I mean, look at how much uh, racism there is online now. It is actually worse than previous years. The racism, for instance, that black footballers are getting if they miss a goal or if they didn't score or for whatever reason, you know, then they're getting attacked online. And people just seem to be more brave and feel that they can do what they want. I don't know if you saw this program recently with Ian Wright and Alan Shearer, where he was showing uh, Ian White was showing Alan Shearer the racist messages that he was yeah. getting on his phone. And Alan Shearer was shocked. He's like, really? You get this? And Ian White was saying, yes, every day. One of them was even saying, BLDM, Black Lives Don't Matter. They're coming out with their own acronym, acronyms now. Wow. You know? So mm. we don't even know if we're further ahead and things have got better. In some ways, yes, but in other ways, it seems things have got worse and I don't know what the balance is right now. We just have to tread really carefully when we go out. That's all I can say. <laughs> we have to well, tread did, carefully and careful what we say. Did you, did, did you see Dawn? Did you see Dawn the other day? It came up through my daughter's school the other day and an, an email came from the head teacher that the Metropolitan Police had, I'd, um, had been warned that for between the 24th of April and the 26th of April, some of you may have seen it, that it had been named as um, National Assault Day, National Assault Day on Women, and, they'd, and it had been given license, and this was on Twitter and other social medias, that um, any man is to violate or sexually assault a woman as part of the National Assault Day and these, these are men which feel that they, their rights are being taken away because of um, Me Too and everything. This was just a few weeks ago. Really? So I had, to, I had to ensure that my daughter, because she was going out for dinner around the local area, wherever she was going, and I said to her, my 16-year-old, I said to her, look, you need to be careful because of this is what's going on. But there wasn't, it wasn't as though the government spoke about it. The Metropolitan Police had been warned about this, and so they were contacting schools, but it wasn't as though you heard something from the government to say, these people have put this on, 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 um, on the media, whatever it is, social media. That, was, that, to me, that to me is very worrying, that we should be alerted to things like that. How, comes, how, can, how can men, white men, feel that they can do this and just get away with it? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's sickening. Yes, it is. Well, well, let's not forget. Um, uh, anyway, let, uh, like you, I, I better hold back on that. Our, our prime, <laughs> prime minister um, has um, 
Yeah, exactly. Leading by example. Yeah, yes. some figures in, in, in the Western world, you know, they, they're very proud of their history of such things, aren't they? And uh, they're, they're no longer around in, in, in the limelight, but, you know, exactly. they, made it, they made it seem to be, well, what's wrong with it? You know, that, so, exactly. yeah, so generally. Well, history. Yeah, that's exactly. Okay, so you ladies are talking in code now, yeah? Yeah. Not really. I don't think we are, but I think people who hear us know what we're talking, talking about. But um, yes, that's what I kind of answers the question, Victoria, really, because it's been legitimised in certain quarters. Exactly. That's it. Okay. National, um, National Assault yeah. Day on women between the 24th and 26th. And I know it's a topic, but I think it's, it's, still, on, it's still on topic. Um, don't mind this, Dawn, mm. but it's still on topic when we talked earlier about women being. Um, obviously in, in abusive situations, or, or men, but mainly women, in abusive situations with their children, and lockdown was just a fearsome time for them because, sorry, fearful time for them because they knew what was coming, what was going to happen, and some were killed, and, and, and so forth. But if you look back in terms of the law in Western countries, in my other countries, in terms of where you could be done for assaulting your wife, or you could be done for raping your wife. It's still fairly modern times. It's not like a hundred and something years ago. So that wheel was moving really, really slowly. Mm. And, um, you know, it just goes to show that, um, you know, things, crimes against women are not seen as being as exactly. important as crimes against men. Well, not black men, but other men. But you know what I mean? Mm. They're just sort of like a nest on to it. And so therefore, something like that, you know, like you were saying, Victoria, why wasn't there more things said that women said, look, be careful, don't go out, you know. No, they, it was somehow. Dumped just, down, just dumped down. down. Yeah. yeah, and that's, and my thing that I, that resonates with me all the time, and I think I might write something on it, because I really want to write something on it, is domestic crimes against women and murder, where women are concerned, because it's across the world, not even in, just in, just in Western the world, but in this lockdown, how many women were still murdered? And we had that case that came up recently, wasn't it? And then the vigils and so forth that did happen and shouldn't, but she was just walking home, you know, and she should have been safe. But at the fact is, somebody who should have known better, you know, mm. I won't name who they are, um, decided to act as though there was some sort of evil, you know, apparition and take her away but I just thought that epitomizes mm. how they see women and it is like if someone's abusing you in a bitch relationship you just like pray they're praying on you literally yeah. I, think you're I think you're absolutely right you know Eve I mean I know I interrupted you but I think you're absolutely that's right fine, I finished. because um I think you're absolutely right though because in lockdown that's something which I really ob ob observed a lot is you had that young girl in October last year young black girl 21 uh, yes. Let on the beach dead. On they beach, tried to say right. it was a su suicide, but her shoes next to her and her phone next to her, suicide. You had those other two young women which were murdered and the police taking selfies of them. Exactly. I mean, I mean and that was all in lockdown. Right. And it was as though it just didn't matter. Uh, yeah. I mean, and those things resonated with me a lot. They really resonated. When you asked um, Dawn what resonated, what resonated to me is the powerlessness of black women. And, yeah. and, and, and where are we? Where are we in all of this? And exactly. I think that's something which I still kind of, I'm still unpacking and I'm, my book, which is near finished now, is about some of this aspect and how it in itself plays out in the workplace mm. because of how black women are seen from all different sides and what, what, where we are in, that, in the pandemic, what, what went on with us? in the pandemic and I think that would be a not a conversation for here but I think it would be a really interesting set of writings um about women's uh, women's narrative of um getting through the um getting black women's narratives getting through the pandemic and I think that would be very interesting is it possible that more black women's voices were heard though during the pandemic because more people were speaking online about what was going on but in the government no, I'm talking about in the in the population. I mean, for instance, during the Black Lives Matter protests, you're getting a lot of celeb oh, yeah, that, black celebrities yeah. telling their truths, speaking of racism that they'd endured. Yeah, you know, 
Yeah. And some are actually scared to do that. I saw one that said Leanne Pinock from Little Mix said that she was worried about speaking out about racism because she thought it might affect her career. Yeah. But she did it. Like Lewis Hamilton, he did as well, didn't he? Yes, yes. Yeah, they they the did. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it, it took the, it, it, it opened up the hornet's nest. It and, did. And, 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 it, and it has opened up and it's, a, and it's a very small breeze coming through. And so we have to, we have to kind of, uh, completely capitalize on that before the before the window slams down shut again because it will well in um, a way because you see no. what that does is that it demonstrates the fact that people who have got to a particular success or celebrity status they did it despite going through racism because i know a lot of people like to say oh look he's done well he's doing really well and he's black but they don't see the road they don't see the journey they don't see the pain and suffering that they might have endured that a white person might not have endured. And they just assume that, oh, you know, if you work hard, you'll get there. But for every one person that makes it, there's 200 who haven't made it, who are on the same journey. But for whatever reason, they got um, put off, you know, or discouraged or told you can't do it. Or ended up in psychiatric units. Yes. Exactly. There's a lot of people in psychiatric units, yes. which, which are extremely educated, extremely um, skilled, and the only thing is, is that they just just couldn't cope anymore. Yeah, couldn't cope, mm. and that's where a lot of our young people are are, are heading at the moment, and and that's another conversation, but um, it's very very worrying about the numbers of our young people, which are depressed at the age of nine, and self harming at the age of nine, ten, and suicides. I don't want to put a depression on it, but it is there is a real situation there of what is actually going on with our young people. I'm not talking about other communities. I'm talking about our young people, mm. and what are we doing to reach out to our young people so they so they feel there's some hope and that we're there for them and that we we see them struggling and we're gonna and and that's what, what I do all the time with my with my students. They they reach out to me. Um, I can have I can have loads of students who reach out to me and I I work with them even though they're not mine, because I'm, I'm, I want to see, you know, I'm concerned about them, oh. that they're, they're slipping away, oh. really, it's really hard, it's hard to watch, it's hard to hear, and um, you have to, you, you know, you, you do what you can to ensure that that young person is, um, is okay, oh. is okay, and I think, I think sometimes uh, many of our communities just, just aren't aware of that there's a lot of young people which have I'm not talking about the hard to reach young people because they seem they seem to have more support in some ways but I'm talking about the young people which people would see as achievers achievers in life which you know they've made it to where they feel they've made it but actually they're suffering in silence they are really suffering and it's those young people because they don't want to talk to their mum dawn because you know, she, they don't want to worry her and, and they think that they, she's doing okay and, and the young person's doing okay. And, they're, and uh, you know, I talk too much, but that, that bit, I think we need to talk more about in our communities, whether it's even on black economics, about what are we, what, what are we doing to reach out to our young people, which um, are just not, you know, they're just, they're just struggling. Yeah. They're struggling. Mm. I'll leave it at that, but they're struggling. Mm. Can I just um, bring another dimension to that? Because what we're seeing, and, and you know I talk about the diaspora quite a bit um, because of my, my own experience, but we're seeing quite a number of young people moving out of the UK to other parts of the world. Um, I know certainly in Ghana, we've seen a lot of young people moving into Ghana. I mean, I'm not saying it any way solves any of the problems, but I'm just saying that they're looking for ways out of the system here. You know, and certainly through the pandemic, you know, around December, January, February, we saw an influx of Ghan um, people from Ghanaians and other parts of um, Americans, Black Americans, going to live in Ghana hmm. because they can work anywhere, right? They've got access to the internet. They can sit there and get on with whatever they're doing. And I know even Barbados had a whole scheme where you could get a visa and go yeah, to the campaign yeah yeah yeah. They did. Yes, yeah yeah they were encouraging people to use their you know their lockdown to sit in barbados where you can actually yeah. have a decent quality of life 
So, um, you know, I think we need to maybe also start thinking about some of these solutions being real. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that we don't sit here and perish, but we can actually go where we can flourish and grow. And, exactly. And feel part of a system where they actually need the skills, they need the people. You know, these countries have very, very small populations that can't deal with a lot of the big problems they're faced with. They need people. Mm. You know, and rather than importing expats that cost a fortune, why don't we look at how we engage with our young people here and give them you know, countries where they will be accepted, appreciated and developed and, you know, and nurtured into magnificent human beings, you know? That's a very As good a point. Option. That's a really good point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. something we should definitely look at. Well, I think that we've more or less come to the end of our discussion around lockdown and the aftermath. And... Uh, I just wanted to ask one last question. Now that travel is going to open up, let's say that you're going to consider somewhere that you want to go, say, three, four months. Give me one country where you want to go. One country. I'm going back to Madeira. Madeira? I like okay. Madeira. I'm going there with my daughter, hopefully in August. Okay. All right. Nice. Eve? I dream of Jamaica. Jamaica <laughs> is calling my name. I normally go there, you know me, Dawn. 18 months doesn't go by and I haven't been there. And now this month will be two years since I've been. So mm. Jamaica, Jamaica, okay. Jamaica. Okay. That's what? Well, I, I'm thinking of exploring Portugal. And that is, um, it's Mass Madeira. <laughs> ah, okay. There you go. <laughs> beautiful yeah this, well i was thinking more of lisbon but yeah i've been to lisbon it's amazing it's great yes. but, yeah, but, Madi but, but madeira is near madeira is nearer to the african coast it, yes. it's an island it's an island ah okay. and it was colonized and it's part of i would say it's part of africa it's nearer there i'll have to look at that because i i did see um, the british airways are often it as a um, one of their um package things so i was looking at madeira today so and mm. portugal is on the green list so you yes, yes it is. Go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think? Lisbon is great. Portugal. Yeah, Lisbon's yeah. nice. Lovely. Well, I'm oh. going to cheat and have two. I want to go to Antigua and I want to go to Dubai. Oh, Antigua's beautiful. Oh, you've been? I did. A, I took my oldest ones for a Caribbean hopping holiday for six weeks. We went away for six weeks to all the different islands. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Lovely. Amazing. Yeah, yeah Antigua's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, nice. I've been all around the world. I've been to so many places, but I love it. I'd love to go to Ghana, but you're not there, uh, Afwa. You told yeah. me I should come over there when you were there, and now you're here. Who am I it's gonna no go problem. You just tell me when you want to go. In fact, I'm thinking of <laughs> organising some sort of retreat and taking oh, we'll, some we'll come with you. With yeah, we'll oh, come with you. Oh, that would be great. I'd yeah, love to go so, to Ghana. Yes. I'd love to go to Ghana. Okay. Oh, yeah. so so we're know. on, right? We're, I'm going to... Because you're not the first group I've spoken to about it, and they're all saying they want to go, so I think oh, I'm going to wow, make that'd be amazing. That'd be great. My next thing, my next thing, John, is um, I'm going to go back to a spa this week. I'm um, in July. I'm aiming to go to a spa for in July. Okay, okay, okay. Wonderful. Excellent. I normally do a spa for a week, at least twice a year. So, okay. Yeah. What a one week spa. Yes, I like. That's that. a long time, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it I, Why not? It's Why best, not? It's, it's, the best, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> I'm sure. Why do you do that, please? By the end of that Why week, you're spa? floating on air, aren't you? Oh, I love it. Well, the thing, the thing to me is that if I go to a hotel, a nice hotel, it has to be a spa hotel because I want yeah, my exactly. treat. I know we do champions. Champions love normally. the treatment. Mm, love the one. treatment. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so I'm with you, Doctor B. Thank you. You're so okay, funny. Okay. Well, thank you so um, much. Can I, can I ask you? Can I ask you a question, everybody? Yeah. Does, any, does anybody want to come and walk the dogs with me at all? I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm just going to go out now. Anybody want to come to walk the dogs? <laughs> You're a bit far for me. Huh? Um, <laughs> I'll give it a minute, but maybe next time. If you look around the world, then that. yes, I would. I'll but, hold you, you know? to that. Yes, maybe next time. Yes, we'll arrange a dog walking date with Victoria. <laughs> yeah, do you know, do you know what fine. I have done, actually? I've got two, two neighbours. Two neighbours in lockdown, which I did, did say, 
two neighbours in lockdown. One lives opposite me, which I've got to know, and she's a black female. She hasn't got dogs. And the other one lives around the corner. She's a director of Newham, one of the directors of Newham. And she's got a dog. She's a Labrador. Labrador. Two black women. They've got very friendly. We, I walk in one with one and one in the other one on the weekend. And when I, when I go for three hour walks and the other one I walk every day. And the one which I go for three hour walks didn't know the forest until I got, got her to know the forest. So you're wow. welcome to come with me. Is it I safe to walk in forests, though? Sorry? Is it safe to walk in forests? Of course it is. I grew up in forests. Yeah? I grew up in Somerset. Quantock Hills. You've That's been watching too place. much Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> 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 no, I've been watching too much news. That's no, you've been watching too much CSI. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the recent case. Oh, you just have to be hearing bodies in the forest to know where you are. Exactly. I tell you, you'd love it. Do come over one day. I'll show you. There's some lovely lakes. If I could show you on my phone, but I can't. Guess what we saw two weeks ago in the lake? My friend was talking. I said, oh, my God, look at that. Guess what we saw? A swan. The black swan. <gasps> the Beautiful. Black swan. That's wow. with, a, with a red beak. And, and, and it was just, it was just going on its own with, amongst all the white swans. And the white swans were kind of just parted. By where really? the black swan, it was beautiful. Yes, oh, it's very rare. The black swans are rare. Sounds yeah. yes. amazing. Beautiful. Yes, black yeah. swans are rare, but they are yes. beautiful. Oh, I've, I've always, I've always um, described myself as a black swan, not knowing that there were black swans in that particular. And, and of course, they, they're in Scotland, aren't they? Black swans in Scotland, in another part of England, and they tried to um, get rid of the black swans, didn't they? By bringing the white swans in, absolutely. But it was beautiful. Yes, yes. Anyway, that's enough of my nonsense. It's time to um. All right. So it looks like we planned Ritz for tea, and we planned to go to the forest with Victor. A picnic. Yeah. For nice. I got a picnic hamper thing from my daughters. I had one before when I got married, but I dumped it. Um, that's another distortion. And we planned a garden. I had a picnic. Uh, you know, a nice picnic hamper. I have one of those. Oh, lovely. And sorry, what dogs have you got? What are they? Miniature Schnauzer. Miniature Schnauzer, and? which is um, really like granddad faces, you know. And um, a Miniature Schnauzer, Miniature Poodle. Oh, I love poodles. Yes. So Harry is a therapy dog. Everybody says he picks up all your emotions, and that's Harry. He's the um, uh, Miniature Schnauzer. They're German dogs, but lovely dogs. And then you've got the um, Miniature Poodle, Miniature Schnauzer. His, they have his, better his, temperaments than other dogs. And my, and my friend's got a Labradoodle. A Labradoodle. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous dog. Yeah, gorgeous. <laughs> Harry's called Morgan. Um, no, the, the other one's called Morgan after Morgan Freeman. All oh, right. Okay, yeah. I, could walk, I could walk with them. I could walk you could, with you'd them. love them. And you'd like it, Dawn, as well. And so would you, so would you, Afra. You'd like it as well. You all like them. Come over for a picnic. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to a picnic. Yeah, when it gets, it gets, when it gets warmer, yeah? Yeah. yeah, it has to be warm. Yeah, that, that could be Christmas then. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, later this month, in June, it'll be warm. It's okay. coming. Okay, Summer's Dawn. coming, I promise. Okay, Dawn. Yeah, I'm looking at your dimples, <laughs> Dawn. I'm looking at your dimples. I believe you, Dawn. You know, I think your dimples actually tell you tell us what you're all about because sometimes your dimples are more dimpled than other times. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, ladies. It's always nice you, to Dawn. meet up and get I energized. It's nice. Oh. So thank you. And I've got a dress on. Have you? Oh, I have you? indeed. I've got a woolly dress. You mean you're showing your legs today? Victoria? I'm showing my legs. Oh, dear. Yes. Oh, it's wasted on us because we can't see below your shoulders, can we? I know, but it's, to me, it's nice. It feels good. Yeah. Okay, guys. So, what's the topic next time? I thought, I thought you had your red. I thought you were wearing red stilettos, Dawn. Who me? <laughs> nah, man. I'm wearing orange, orange stripes, orange socks, and blue and white striped pajama bottoms. I don't believe you. I do not believe you. <laughs> Where's your orange you socks? Show us. Oh my! Oh my goodness me! Stop <laughs> it! <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> oh dear! Eve, Eve did say that before. We were all all masked up. Thank you. Look at her. I can do this look. Something else. I won't even show you what I've got on because that's another story altogether. I've got a nice dress on. Honestly, I'm being. I'm look. 
a nice dress, you see? Oh, nice. Yes, I've got a nice dress on. Dress for the occasion. <laughs> I can't believe uh, you got those. You got those pajama bottoms on. Yeah, you gotta be real, man. You gotta be real. <laughs> <laughs> Go straight to bed after this. <laughs> Just saving time. You're, so, you're bad. Look at you. My Save goodness. Oh, lordy lord. Dawn, I'm seeing you in a different light. <laughs> Here's me thinking you had your stilettos on and everything else. Oh know. yeah. When you only see me from the shoulders up, why would I put? Some... I haven't put on stilettos for years. I don't even know if I remember how to walk in them. <laughs> lessons by the time we start going out again. Oh, dear. You're so funny, all of you. Oh, yeah. dear, dear. Anyway, lovely seeing you.